People involved in controversial issues in the church, like the Age of the Earth debate, are sometimes accused of being divisive. This week on Creation Magazine Live, who's being divisive? Is it those who promote an old Earth or a young Earth? Welcome to Creation Magazine Live. My name is Richard Fangrad. And I'm Calvin Smith. Our topic this week is who is being divisive when it comes to controversial issues in the church? Now, our focus is going to be, uh, obviously you may have guessed this, on the creation evolution issue, right. especially the age of the earth debate, very controversial, but this could apply to, to, to basically any controversial issue. Absolutely. So it's kind of going to be a short overview of how to deal with some of the related divisions in the church. And we can begin by saying that unity is serious. We need to strive for unity. That's right. Jesus prayed that those who believe in him would be brought into complete <laughs> unity or become perfectly one so that the world will know that you sent me. Now, since Jesus made unity uh, a, a big issue, we as his followers also need to make it a priority. Yeah, John uh, chapters 14 to 16 outline the basis of this unity that Jesus prayed for. To be united, his disciples must obey Jesus as the Holy Spirit guides them into all truth. Right. So the unity that we're to strive for as Christians is a unity around the truth. Specifically, we're to be unified in the, in the way we think. Our, our, our thoughts are to be focused on truth. That's right, yeah. Christians are those who love Jesus, mm -hmm. who understand and are immersing themselves in truth in what Jesus said and then following his commandments. John 14, 15 to 26 makes this connection, the, the connection between those who are Christians and that we are to obey truth over and over again. Uh, this is a, a bit more of a lengthy passage, but uh, you can look for, look for this connection as we read here. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. There's that connection there. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth. Their truth is mentioned. Whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells in you and will be in you. And dwells with you and will be in you. And I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, again there, the truth, the, 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 there's that link again, it is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, anyone who loves me will keep my word. There's that connection again. Love Jesus, keep the truth, keep his word. And my father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Hmm. So we can look at other verses that emphasize the same theme here. Same thing, yeah. You know, in, in the first few, few verses of John 15, Jesus taught that we must abide in him, just as the branches of a grapevine remain connected to the, um, to the grapevine. So verse 10 reads... Um, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Uh, one of those commandments is, love each other as I have loved you, as it says in John 15, 12 to 13, and verse 17. And in Hebrews 12, uh, 14, it says, strive for peace with everyone and, a, and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. So again, we see this command to, to strive for peace or, or to strive for, yeah. for unity. Here it's tied to the need for spiritual growth. Christians are commanded to grow in their knowledge of God and then apply that to their thinking and their behavior. 
Right. Yeah, referring to spiritual growth, Ephesians 14 mentions that we are to move beyond being a little children because mm. you'll be tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning and craftiness in deceitful schemes. And the reason the Lord gave to the church the leadership he gave was for them to grow spiritually and to be unified. Uh, look at the two verses before this one here. In verse 12 and 13, it says, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the, here it is, unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, for the equipping of the saints till they come to the full stature of Christ. That's the goal for Christians. Mm -hmm. And, and it's related to the subject of unity in the church. And that might be quite a bit to take in, but we'll, we'll, when we come back, we're going to start a list of a few main points to keep in mind when dealing with the subject of unity and division in the church. We'll right back. Many people think that the biblical flood of Noah was abandoned because of the evidence. However, history tells a different story. Modern geological thought owes much to a man named Charles Lyell. Lyell, a lawyer, published a book in 1830 called Principles of Geology. Described as a masterpiece of persuasion, it changed the way people thought about Earth's past. According to Lyell, we should only appeal to today's geological processes to explain Earth history. However, this approach meant that the global flood recorded in the Bible was automatically ruled out of consideration. Lyell wanted, he wrote, to free the science of geology from Moses. Regrettably, many people have uncritically adopted Lyell's philosophy without considering how Noah's flood can help us understand Earth history. Lyell changed the way many people think, but his approach was motivated by his anti-biblical philosophy. Indeed, it is very difficult to explain Earth's history without Noah's flood. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. Well, if you just tuned in, uh, we're trying to determine who's being divisive in the church when it comes to controversial issues. Right. Uh, we're starting with uh, what God says about the issue by looking at Scripture. So let's list a few main points here regarding unity and division in the church. The first point is that Christians are to strive for unity, and Jesus prayed for his church to be unified. Right. Another point is that the unity we're to strive for is a unity focused around the truth of Scripture. Mm -hmm. uh, when, we have unity when we obey Jesus, my words remain in you, as it says in John 15, 17. So another point is, those who do not obey Jesus cause disunity. Right. Titus 3.10 gives us further instructions saying, as for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him. So there's quite a strong command to reject uh, a divisive person. Yeah, that's pretty serious. Yep. And not only that, Christians are warned to watch out for those who divide the church, those who, uh, quote, put obstacles in your way mm -hmm. that are contrary the, to the teaching that you learned. It says that in Romans 16, 17. So the dividers are those who depart from the doctrines revealed in Scripture. The only basis for unity is agreement on the authority of the Bible's <laughs> teaching. Those who defer to another authority cause division. For example, using man-made estimates of the age of the earth <laughs> to interpret scripture. That's another authority. Exactly. So now really we're getting into the related area of discernment. Discernment, discernment. Yes. yeah. So the ability to, as Charles Spurgeon said, know the difference between right and almost right. That's discernment. That's the key. Any, anytime you talk about truth, you have to talk about discernment. Truth stands apart from error, and of course truth divides. It always does, because it's, it's unique. Yeah. We, we live in an information age, there's no doubt. We're bombarded with information. Some is good information that we can base our lives and our thinking and our behavior on, and other information is trash that, that we should just be <laughs> setting to ignore and, and, and not bothering with. But how do you know which is which? Discernment. Right. Uh, if you have, through practice and the continual input of God's truth, God's word into your life, honed your ability to discern, then you'll know the difference. Right. Hebrews 5 puts it this way. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he's a child. But solid food is for the mature for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Uh, it's yeah. through constant practice, right? Uh, by absorbing the solid food of biblical truth that your powers of determinant are trained. And That's hold. right. It's important to be able to discern 
the non-biblical argument from the biblically supported argument mm -hmm. in a controversial issue. We also need to come to grips with what Jesus said about unity and division. Now, it's a little bit different here. He said, he said this, Do not think that I have come to give peace on earth. No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, in one house there will be five divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter, daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Right. So in an overview of divisiveness in the church, like we're going to do here today, we need to throw into the mix and, and come to understand what Jesus meant by this. Yes. He's talking about the fact that not everyone will believe and follow truth. It's very common that some people in a family recognize that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that one gets to heaven, and, you know, no one gets to heaven unless it's through him, and of course others don't. Right, yeah. Jesus is very clear that the truths of Scripture will divide people. In 1 Corinthians 11, for example, it says this, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. Hmm. So not only will division happen, Paul says, but it must happen when there's a controversial issue in the church, right. as there was in the church in, in Corinth at the time. Uh, it's to separate those who, from, from those who follow what Scripture says from those who don't. Yeah. Uh, so, when, so how are we to strive for unity when we know that division must happen? John MacArthur adds some cl clarification here when he wrote in his blog, he said, no true Christian wants to be contentious. No one, no one who has the mind of Christ enjoys conflict. Obviously, harmony is preferable to discord. But when some crucial truth is at stake, how do we display the mind of Christ? certainly not by allowing the error to go unchallenged. If we truly are to be like our Savior, we must both proclaim truth and condemn error in unambiguous language. So we could add another point to our, to our list here. And, and Martin Luther beautifully summarized it saying, peace if possible, truth at all costs. Right. So we strive for unity, but not by marginalizing the truths of Scripture. You know, we, we could go on summarizing the main issues involving unity and division in the church, but this is probably sufficient, I think, for today's topic. So who's being divisive when it comes to the creation evolution issue and the age of the earth? Well, we're going to get into that when we come back after this short break. Genesis Verse by Verse is a Bible study tool available on CMI's website, designed to help pastors, students, and laymen alike Study the book of Genesis like never before, and it's completely free. Simply look up any verse in Genesis 1-11, to or just scroll down the page. The center column provides links to articles that answer common questions pertaining to that verse, and the topics that naturally arise from them. Visit creation.com to use it today. On this week's episode, we're talking about who is being divisive when it comes to the creation evolution issue, and especially the age of the earth debate. That's mm -hmm. very controversial. Yep. Now, here's a list summarizing some of the things from Scripture to keep in mind when dealing with this topic or any divisive topic. Now, let's apply this list, these things, to the origins debate. Right. Uh, there's a very interesting account in Jude where we read, uh, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, in the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the men who divide you. Now, yeah. Jude was reminding the yeah. believers of the prophecy that scoffers who don't follow Scripture would cause division in the church. And he was clearly referring to the Apostle Peter's words in 2 Peter 3. Yes, because uh, they're, they're, they're very similar. Yeah. Uh, beginning in verse 3, we read this. Scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlook this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. Right. So the scoffers who divide the church say that all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. Well, this describes the doctrine of uniformitarianism, Very an good. idea yep. promoted from the late 1700s, beginning with James Hutton. And of course, Hutton and his successors, including Darwin, claimed that only the processes we see happening today are, are responsible for forming and filling the earth. 
Right, yeah. Since all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation, well, that includes creation as well. Mm -hmm. now, even atheists talk about the creation of the universe, but they'll claim that the universe created itself, right. which is a logical <laughs> impossibility. Uh, it, it created itself by the laws of physics, apparently, that we observe today. That's the, that's the Big Bang. Right. Now, about those who promote uh, these ideas, the Apostle Peter say that they deny that God created the earth in the way the Bible tells us. Genesis tells us that God created the earth covered in water. That's in Genesis 1-2 uh, and 2 right. Peter 3-5. Uh, but naturalistic theories about the earth's origin say it started in a, as a hot molten blob, yep. um, you know, no liquid water. These scoffers promote godless theories about origins, denying the clear teaching of the Word of God. Their authority isn't the Bible, but the the whims of man's fallen intellect, of course, an intellect in rebellion against the, their creator. That's right. And they, they also fail to recognize the limitations of science. You know, we can't do experiments on the past, so being a scientist doesn't help you in understanding uh -huh. what really took place, uh, you know, when the universe started. That's right. Uh, but they, they don't only deny creation, they deny the flood, <laughs> that the flood deluged and destroyed the world, as it says in 2 Peter 3, verse 6. Right. Those who accept creation over billions of years must also, if they think logically, yep. deny the global nature of Noah's flood. The, but the flood was clearly global. Yep. Uh, two years ago we did a show on this, 12 reasons why the, why the flood is global. You can watch it online at creation.com slash cml4-24. Yeah, so, so Peter prophesied that there would be uh, creation deniers, flood deniers, yep. and we see that everywhere today, in the church. <laughs> it's, it's those who dispute what the Bible says about creation, the flood, etc., who caused division, according to the Bible. You know, believers didn't have a problem for 1,800 years knowing what the Bible says, and all of a sudden, uh, you know... When the Darwin, millions of years become popular, then everything then changes. Then there's a problem. Yeah. But, and that's the same as any other, other, uh, any other topic. You could apply those same kinds of principles there to, to wrestle through those issues. Yeah. It's those who dispute what the Bible says who cause division. Not those who are saying, you know, let's dive into Scripture and determine what the truth is in this area. Right. Even uh, where people are you know, anti-evolution. If they teach uniformitarian doctrines like the Big Bang, slow cooling of the earth over billions of years, local flood, no matter how much they profess to be evangelical, they're clearly in the same camp as the scoffers. Right. The only logical basis for unity is the authority of Scripture. God's Word, His infallible Word. Departure from that causes division. And we'll be right back with more. If Arnold Schwarzenegger had a pet cow, I can almost guarantee it would be a Belgian Blue. These cows are incredibly muscled and have very little fat. Many people think of this breed as evolution in action because a mutation in its DNA has brought about a supposed improvement. But if microbes really did turn into Belgian Blue cows, which is what evolution teaches, this would require the addition of lots of new DNA information to turn the relatively simple genome of a bacteria into the vastly more complicated genome of a cow. However, in the case of Belgian blue cows, we see the opposite because no new information has been added. In fact, a mutation has corrupted the myostatin gene, which normally stops muscles growing too big. So information has been lost. The cows have lost control over muscle growth. So Belgian blue cows have devolved, not evolved. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. Well, our subject this week is who is being divisive. We just looked at a, at a prophecy in scripture that implicates creation deniers and flood deniers specifically as those who cause division, not those who uphold biblical creation in a global flood. Right, so on that basis alone, it would be sufficient to label organizations who promote those false ideas as the ones who cause division and sometimes church splits mm -hmm. over the issue of creation. Right. But let's look at a real example. John Lennox is professor of mathematics at Oxford University. He's an internationally renowned, renowned speaker on the, the interface of science and philosophy and religion. He wrote a book back in 2011 called Seven Days That Divide the World, and we did a book review on it. Right, now the book is an attempt 
uh, supposedly to bring unity into the controversial issue of the length of the days in Genesis 1. So it represents an opportunity to dive into scripture to figure out what is being communicated there about the days. Honestly, the word day, it's a simple word. It really shouldn't be that difficult to figure this out. Yeah, it's a simple word. Okay, so he reasoned that. Uh, he said this, there must ultimately be harmony between correct interpretation of biblical data and the correct interpretation of the scientific data. And he's absolutely right. Uh, th there is a harmony there, a perfect harmony, but not from his point of view because Lennox believes in millions of years, an idea that doesn't come from scripture. Yeah, in the book review by one of our, our Bible scholars, it says, he gives the usual pitch about the word day having many possible meanings and then launches into his proposal for interpreting Genesis 1's creation week. He proposes the initial creation did not take place on day one, but was a long time before that. That's on page 53 in his book. He further offers that the author of Genesis did not intend us to think of the first six days as a single earth week, but rather as a sequence of six creation days. That is, days of normal length, with evenings and mornings, as the text says, in which God acted to create something new. But days that might well have been separated from one another by unspecified periods of time. That's on page 54 as well. At this point, there's a certain sort of impasse because in a more technical work, one would expect Lennox to go on to prove exegetically that his interpretation was plausible based on the structure of the Hebrew text and the verb forms and used and so on. That's right. But this is not a technical work and it may be unfair to expect this sort of sophistication in a little book which makes, so, uh, makes no pretensions of being scholarly uh, a scholarly volume. So it must suffice to say that Lennox gives no evidence for this interpretation, let alone argument that it is superior to a literal understanding of the creation week, and therefore it may be dismissed with as little argumentation as he gives evidence. <laughs> suffice uh, it is to say, if it were right, then logically the days of our working week could also have long periods between them. Since Exodus 20, 8 to 11 makes an explicit connection between the working week and the day of rest with creation week. Great right. summary. Yeah. Now, it's, it's remarkable that in a book called Seven Days That Divide <laughs> the World, he, he simply says that the word day has multiple meanings, as do many other theologians. It just has multiple meanings, but doesn't bother to try to determine the specific meaning that it has from the context in Genesis 1, but rather applies some, some strange personal view that doesn't originate with the text. It's, it's a failed attempt to bring unity where there's division. It is, yeah. Uh, Hugh Ross is another example. Ross takes the additional step and actually says that he takes Genesis literally. <laughs> well, we here at, at CMI, Creation Ministries International, also say that. So, but Ross believes that the days in Genesis are long periods of time. One of us is wrong. Exactly. That one organization is teaching what the Bible says, and the other is causing church splits. Yeah, if you want to figure out which one, read Genesis 1 without any outside ideas. Just draw the meaning from the text and see what it says. Yes, yeah. And I remember I was speaking uh, about 15 years ago at a church that was on the verge of splitting after they had Hugh Ross in for a seminar. And I was speaking with, with one of our other scientists, and near the end of this, this two-day conference, a lady came up to me and said, uh, thank you for coming. Now I, can, now, now I know I can believe the Bible again. Yeah, and it's and really just, sad. Uh, yeah. You know, Ross's organization is basically saying, let us tell you how to understand what the biblical text really says, you know, after we twist it and conform it with yeah, millions yeah, of years. Yeah. Um, his beliefs about the age of the earth issue clearly take priority over what the text says. Right, the bottom line is we're in a truth war. Our role as followers of Christ is to speak the truth in love, always striving for peace and unity. And Martin Luther's quote is really a good summary. Peace if possible, truth at all costs. We'll be right back. Are you skeptical about Christianity? Perhaps you're a Christian but know someone who won't consider Christianity. Christianity for Skeptics is one of CMI's most popular books. Written by Drs. Steve Kumar and Jonathan Safati, this powerful resource refutes many attacks on the Christian faith. It contains cutting-edge research, solid theology, and a summary of the Christian roots of science. Questions about Islam, atheism, suffering, evidence for God, and more are answered. Full of bright, catchy illustrations and a sleek modern style, this book draws in any reader. Purchase this resource and many others at creation.com. 
All right, as we wrap up today's uh, show here, we're going to look at a feedback that we got. And this is actually a feedback to an article that you did, Cal, right. a little while ago. And then we did a video on that as well, one of our other teaching video uh, programs. So I'll just, I'll read a bit of the feedback that came in and then you can, you can summarize your, the sure. response that you gave here. I'd like to share a few points on this article. Firstly, I don't think people's reluctance to engage in a discussion of Christianity can be reduced mainly to efforts of teaching evolution. I am an atheist, but I am only minimally interested in the details of evolution and feel similarly about physics and astronomy, etc. For me personally, then, evolution is not central to my disbelief in the Christian God or any God. And then a little bit later they say, I base my, my disbelief on scientific but also logical, moral, and philosophical grounds. Right. So. Well, um, I, uh, CMI is kind of unique in the sense that we uh, produce articles and then the actual authors of the articles, for two weeks afterwards, you can submit uh, feedback and we'll actually answer you. The author will get back to you yeah, and yeah. so on. And so I actually answered Megan a couple of points and I said, number one, look, if you're an atheist, you have to believe in evolution. Yeah. It's central to your belief system because you have to explain how you got here without God and evolution is your only game in town. It so, doesn't matter if you're, you're not concerned with the details, uh, as she uh, says there, you still right. have to believe in it. Well, right. And she says, well, she's not in interested in the details, but I pointed out you know, she later on in her in her uh, feedback here, she said, "I base my belief on scientific uh, gra and grounds." My disbelief. My disbelief. Yeah. Well, then, if you're not interested in the details, but you b base your whole belief system on scientific grounds, but you, you don't know about the details, see, that's a faith. You're an atheist, yeah. and you have yeah. to have a way to explain the world without God. So you believe in evolution by faith. And it's, and it's more of a zealot type of a thing, where, where you believe it, but you, you don't really know why you believe, can't explain why you believe, but yeah. you, you gotta, you got to believe it anyway. Details aren't important, and, yeah. and, and, and so on like that. And um, she also mentions here, also in terms of schooling, I would say that it was not evolution specifically, but more likely a teaching of the scientific method and critical thinking skills. That, that got her on this path of uh, atheism and so on. Right. Well, we did a show on this just a couple of weeks ago, right? That's, that's right. Was that last week? Uh, <laughs> last week, yeah. Talking about uh, quotes from evolutionists that say, you know, it's naive people that's... thinking that the scientific method, you know, that the scientific method can't prove evolution, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't believe in evolution. Yeah. Well, it's it, naive to think that the scientific method is, is how science works when it comes to evolution. Right. <laughs> well, right here, if she had critical thinking skills, then she wouldn't believe in evolution because the scientific method cannot show evolution uh, occurring. So she's not really basing her beliefs on scientific grounds, but she also says, but her her disbelief is based on logical, moral, and philosophical grounds. Well, right. as I pointed out to her, um, you know, then logic, you know, it isn't re even really being used because where does a universal, unchanging, immaterial entity like logic come from? In her worldview, that uh, you know, she lives in a universe supposedly is derived from matter and energy that's constantly changing. Yeah, yeah. Well, you can't explain logic, and I said you can't explain morality. You can't explain right or wrong if there's no God, right? Yes, so, yeah. Anyway, it was and an interesting dialogue and a uh, good one for people to look up. Yeah, we've said this before that you need to, that, that atheists need to borrow from the Christian basis for morality in order to even have a conversation. Right. But uh, it's kind of interesting. Creation, Creation Magazine Live, this is based on Creation Magazine. You can view a free issue of crea digital issue, creation.com slash free mag. Now next week, what about the Garden of Eden? That's our topic next week. See you next week. <laughs>